On Thursday evening last, we were occupied with Psalm 51, and the Lord gave us a very precious word, and our brother was very greatly helped. We shall not forget it. And I'm sure he will not feel that I am trying to improve upon what was said when I bring you back to that psalm this morning for a few minutes. That is not my thought at all, but before Thursday and since, an emphasis has been in me of one part of the psalm And I feel that it is the Lord's message for us. It is in verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. I think that in a very real sense that is the heart of the psalm. We were able to really recognize the meaning of those words just exactly what they do signify we should see that everything in this psalm and in the wider context of this psalm in deep human experience with God everything is centered there and it is the key to everything. We can, I am sure, say this Psalm touches the deepest depths that ever man could touch in the need of God and the mercy of God. In Psalm 1, we have the blessedness of the man who has not walked in sin, the counsel of the ungodly, and so on. Well, his is a blessedness indeed. In Psalm 32, we have the blessedness of the man whose sin is covered, whose iniquity is pardoned, whose sin is covered. And I take it that that is the provision which is made in sacrifice and blood and priesthood for the man who sins. Well, it's blessed to find that provision on hand. But here in this psalm, we're altogether outside of any of the ordinary provisions. Perhaps you have not recognized this, that David's sin which was behind this psalm was altogether outside of the provision of the law of Moses. There was no provision in that whole sacrificial system for this sin. The sin of David was the sin unto death. It was blood guiltiness the sin unto death, the only thing that the law had to say for sinning in this way was death. And so we are all together outside of the provision of the law here, vast, comprehensive, and detailed as that provision was. It made no provision. God has got to make some special provision here. We were reminded on Thursday 
that it is in that special provision of the sacrifice of his son, something far bigger than any Jewish sacrifice or altar or priesthood, something reaching deeper down than anything that ever, ever was known in Israel. It is in that that we find David saved from death. He knew the depth of his sin. He cried, as you know here, that he might be delivered from blood guiltiness. Well, this is the deepest point to which we can come. Any man can come. There are different degrees of God's dealing with the soul. He deals with us upon one level, in a certain way. And then we go into a deeper depth. And he's got to deal with us in another and deeper way. And still we go deeper. And he has got to make a provision and deal with us in a still deeper way. I'm not saying that it is in the ordering and will of God that we go right down to these depths. But here is a wonderful thing. God is going to touch bottom in this matter of man's sin and man's need and his own grace. He'll touch bottom. That is, he'll go to the deepest depths. And when David says, Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, he's going beyond the law, which was all outward. No mere formalism about this. No mere Jewish ritual in this. No mere outward observance of the rites and the ceremonies in this. No, this has got to go right into the innermost being, in the inward parts, in the inward parts. And God works toward that. God is ever working toward the most inward parts. Do you recognize that? Do you understand what he's doing with us? Oh, he will meet us in blessing on a certain level as we walk before him like the man in Psalm 1. He will meet us with his gracious provision when we transgress and trespass and fail and do wrong. He'll meet us there in grace. But God is going to pursue this matter to the most inward place of our being and register there his work of grace and redemption. Thou desirest. And David did not come to that until he reached the profoundest, the deepest place of need of failure, of conscious weakness and worthlessness. Then he cried, it's not enough to just please God in ordinary ways. It is not enough to observe the ritual of the law and go to the ceremonies and carry out all that which is external. God is after truth in the inward part, right down into the depths of our being. Why? Why? Because truth is a major feature and constituent of the divine nature. God is called the God of truth. God of truth. 
Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, called himself the truth. I am the truth. For this purpose came I into the world that I might bear witness of the truth. The Holy Spirit is described as the Spirit of truth when he, the Spirit of truth, is come. The Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are characterized by this one feature, truth. And God desires and has set his heart upon having people who are partakers of the divine nature. And so he is working ever more deeply toward this end. What is true of himself shall be true of his children those begotten of him, that they should be true sons of God in this sense. Satan is described as the liar and the father of liars. For that reason, all untruth is an abomination to God. God has consigned all liars to the lake of fire. He has excluded from the new Jerusalem everything that maketh a lie. God hates everything that is not true. Not true. And true right through and through like himself. He hates it. He must have. He desires truth in the inward part. The interference of Satan with God's creation, with man, resulted in man becoming something false where God is concerned. He is a misrepresentation of God's mind. And he is a deceiver creature. The God of this age, says Paul, had blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Man is a deceived, blinded creature. Thou desirest truth in the inward part. Now you see how large a matter this is. and One is hard pressed to know what to say and what not to say about it. But let us dwell for a moment upon this clause. The inward part. The inward part. You will detect in this psalm that that is running right through, you know. Here it is in the inward part, creating me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. A broken spirit and a contrite heart thou wilt not despise. You see, it's all this, this innermost realm of things that has now risen as the real need. The real need. No more deception, no more falsehood, no more mockery, no more make-believe, no more going on as though it was all right when it is not all right, no more using external means to cover over inward foulness, no more going to meetings and saying prayers and joining in the whole system when the inward part are not right before God. The inward parts. Seeing then that we are what we are by nature now. This represents a reconstituting of us. A reconstituting of us. Anything that does not 
minister to that is false in itself. Any system of religion that just puts on from the outside and covers over the inner life by mere rite and ritual is false. It's not true. The work of God is to reconstitute human nature. And that, of course, involves two things. On the one side, it, it involves a breaking down. Breaking down. And if you know anything about God's dealings with lives which come into his hands, there is undoubtedly a large place for that. A progressive breaking down. Breaking down. Getting to the root of things and undeceiving us. We've got any illusions about ourselves, they'll all be gone when God has done with us. If we are governed by any kind of falsehood or lie about ourselves and our position and our worth, when God has done with us, that will all be gone. He's going to break us down until we see ourselves stark as an unclean thing with all our righteousnesses as filthy rain. So he will break us down, and he does. But there's the other side, of course, all the time, for God is not only and always negative, there is the constructing, bringing us to the place where anything that is false, anything that is not absolutely transparent, true, straight, clear, is hateful to us. More and more our inner man revolts against our own falsehood. Any exaggeration comes back on us at once with conviction of wrong. Any false statement hits us hard and we know we've not spoken the truth. Oh, it's a tremendous thing to get into the hands of the Holy Spirit. To this reconstituting of our entire nature. Until, like God, one thing, one thing that we hate is anything that is false. I hate, said David, every false way. I hate every false way. We must come there, but we must be great lovers of the truth. This is going to pursue us everywhere. It will pursue us into our own life within ourselves, that we are not deceiving ourselves at all. We are not deceiving ourselves. Before God, we know exactly what God thinks about us. And we know where we stand in the light. It will pursue us into our social life. And all our social lies, lies and make-beliefs will have to come under the light of God. Oh, what a tremendous amount of falsehood. Make-believe there is in the social realm. Yes, our economy is built up very largely. Our social economy is built up on lies. What about all the make-up? Isn't it to make out that you're something that you're not? To give a semblance of something that is not true? See, the whole social life is like that's a fabric of untruths and we have many ways of just saying things that really are not true. The friendly lie. Pursue us into our business. The lie that gets a good sale or a good buy. The commercial lie. And so through and through God will pursue this matter of truth. Forgive me, dear friends, but it's a very, very important thing with God. If God does hate what is untrue and desires truth in the good past, how can he bless where there's anything that is false of any kind at all? His eyes see. Well, he's got to reconstitute us, and that's what the spirit of truth does. And this is a time work. Indeed, it's a lifelong work, a lifelong work. And I think this thing comes more 
until light becomes more intense the further on you go. The Lord lets you off with a lot of things as spiritual infants as we do with our children. We know that they are children and we don't take too much notice of certain things which we know are not quite right or not at all right. And God is very patient and very tender to bring us on, to bring us on. It wouldn't do for him to come right in with all the fullness of the exactness of his nature too soon. He spreads it over a whole lifetime. And the nearer we come to the Lord, the closer we walk with him, the more meticulous the Holy Spirit is over this matter of truth closer are his dealings with us. It's very true. You see, perfecting truth in the fear of the Lord. Perfecting. The nearer we get to the end, perhaps, the more stringent will be the Lord's dealings with anything false in our lives. It's a time matter, but God is very faithful He's very faithful. He doesn't let things pass. Do we want him to? Well, it's not comfortable to say yes, but it's good that he should be faithful with every inconsistency, every contradiction, every falsehood in the inward part. That carries the matter deeper than our own natural moral life. I'm not talking about morals now. It's right to be honest. It's right to have integrity. It's right to be straight. It's right to be true naturally, humanly, but I'm not talking about that. This thing goes deeper than what we call common honesty. It's deeper than our natural moral life at its best. Simple reason that by nature we have not got God's conceptions and God's standards. God's thoughts about things are very different from ours. We would very often allow what God would never allow. He has a different point of view about things altogether. We judge in one way and God judges in another. It is necessary for us to come to God's standpoint about things. Oh, we would say there's no harm in that. What's the Lord say about it? Oh, there's no wrong in that. Look at so and so and so. And And take our standard perhaps from other people. We have known people to do that. Point to some outstanding figure in the work of God in whose life was a certain thing and that one taken as the model to be copied and that thing, oh, there's no harm in it. Look at so-and-so and I have known lives and ministries to be ruined on that very principle. No, no, God says, walk before me. Not before any human model. Not before any human standard. Don't reason like that. There's no harm in it. So and so does it. It's quite a common practice. No, no. Walk before me. We've got to get this in the spirit. In the spirit. The inward man is deeper than our best moral standard. Otherwise, There's no point to it being in the Bible at all if our moral standards can rise to God's satisfaction. Why must we be so handled and reconstituted? It's deeper than our intellect, than our reason. You cannot, by reason or intellect, arrive at God's standard at all. Not at all. Oh, don't think that ever by any method of reasoning you're going to reach God's standard. Never will. 
Spirit is only by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Christ has got to be revealed in our hearts by the Spirit. There's no point in Jesus saying when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth if we could get there by our own intelligence. Not at all. It must come by the Spirit revelation of Christ in our hearts, in the inward part. This is something spiritual. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth go together. Only what is spiritual, what is of God, is truth. Only that. The Apostle Paul had a great intellect, as everybody knows. And he had a very high standard of moral life. But he was an utterly deceived man before his conversion. I verily thought that I ought, as a matter of conscience with me, to do many things contrary. Conscientious. could say as concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. There's a moral standard, there's an intellectual standard, there's a conscientious standard, but all wrong, all wrong, mistaken, deceived. No, that's not the way. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit himself in us, changing us, completely changing us. May be that common honesty, sincerity will be a way along which God can come. Quite sure that if we're not going to be honest and straight with God, He's not going to meet us. But that will not get us there. He may require the gangway across which to pass to us of meaning business with Him and being thoroughly honest before him. But let us not think that any sincerity of ours can ever bring us to be partakers of the divine nature. Not at all. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, in the inward parts, the deepest realm of our being, in our spirit. Well, I think that's all I dare take time to say on this matter this morning but we ought to leave it at the point where we do recognize that God has provided for this in sending the Holy Spirit when he the spirit of truth is come it all, it's all a matter of the Holy Spirit as Lord within us having his place as absolute Lord over intellect over our own moral pride and conceit satisfaction. Oh, he's, let me come back where I started. The Holy Spirit will take this thing right down. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, what are you hoping in? What are you hoping in? Something in yourself? The man of Psalm 1? Or are you hoping in the law and the ritual and the ceremonies and the sacrifices man in Psalm 32 you get you get God's mercy and grace there if you can satisfy him on either of those grounds at all as a blessing but God is not going to stop there and thank God he doesn't do I say it too terrible a thing and I say that God will bring us to the place of complete despair on all other grounds than his mercy in order that he might reach his end. Reach his end, which is his own satisfaction in us, that no flesh should glory in his presence. He that glorieth shall glory in the Lord. So our song is of mercy and of grace boundless beyond, beyond anything that ever has been provided for in the old economy 
it is provided for in Jesus Christ.